Hello, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let me invite you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.16. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Do you like self-help? Do you like uh, quick and easy steps to improve whatever in your life? How about three steps or guides to do this or that, to improve your health or to alleviate stress? Three steps maybe to make you look younger? Three steps to get rid of your bunions? I don't know. How about three steps to getting rich? How about these three steps? Be born into a wealthy family. Cozy up to the relative who holds the purse strings. And number three, outlive them. Or how about these three steps to a more youthful looking you where step one is to rent a time machine? Not so helpful, huh? Uh, those things usually rent by the hour and chances are you'll have to go back more than a few. Uh, the only way maybe to afford that time machine is to outlive your relative. Um, I was talking to a younger guy, it's been a while ago, and he had been battling some uh, health issues, specifically with regards to his heart. And he told me that his doctor told him, and he did, um, to, uh, his doctor told him to remove uh, three things from his diet. Now, probably more things, but three things that he remembers and that he removed from his diet, including pizza, donuts, and ice cream. And I thought at the time, eh, I should probably be looking at my out for my heart, so I thought, I'll probably, I'll remove these things from my diet as well. Uh, but you know what? It, it got kind of hard because I really have a fondness for pizza and donuts and ice cream. And so I thought, well, uh, let's just make some substitutes. And I just used uh, the same letter from the alphabet for each one. And so uh, instead of pizza, donuts, and um, ice cream, I removed from my diet um, pomegranates, uh, dragon fruit, and iceberg lettuce. And it worked out great, as far as I know. My heart seems to be okay. Um, and I wasn't eating those things anyway. Well, sometimes three, uh, three steps are, uh, to doing this or that are somewhat arbitrary. Um, they might be helpful and they might not be helpful. Um, all that is basically an introduction to what we're going to talk about today. Because there are certain steps that are massively helpful and immensely practical. And the most potent ones, the, the ones that make the most different to, difference to your soul and to eternity, are found in Scripture. And we're going to look at three such steps today in three short verses. And just as a side note, to answer that burning question, what three verses should I memorize next, here are three good ones. Uh, they're short, uh, and they're good to have on the brain and in the heart as constant prods, especially when life gets a little tough. So let's look at the, this passage, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now in the original language in which Paul wrote, which was Greek, um, each of these verses are abnormally worded. In fact, it's one long sentence, but they're broken up into three phrases or clauses. And each clause is abnormally worded. Uh, what I mean by that is that the adverb is placed first in each clause instead of the verb. And this serves to emphasize the adverb so that um, literally, uh, more literally speaking, these verses would read, always rejoice, constantly pray, in everything give thanks. And so the emphasis is, a, is on always and constantly or unceasingly and in everything. In other words, these commands are comprehensive. These steps are comprehensive. They apply when? They apply always. They apply always, always, continually, in all circumstances. So let's look at each of these three commands in turn. The first one is rejoice always, or literally, always rejoice. Note that believers are uh, to be joyful and not sour. Well, how can I be joyful? You might ask, how can I be joyful? My bank account is down, my blood pressure is up, there's a pandemic going on, and there's racial tension that is exploding all over the place. Good question. How can you be joyful in these circumstances? Well, one answer is that your circumstances shouldn't govern your outlook. They shouldn't govern your attitude. They shouldn't quench, you, quench your joy. Uh, a long time ago, I heard Carmen, uh, the contemporary Christian singer, talking about a conversation he had with a friend. And he asked his friend, how are you doing? And his friend said to him, okay, under the circumstances. And Carmen looked at him and said, brother, what are you doing under the circumstances? And that's a good point. As a Christian, what is he doing being governed by his circumstances? 
So the first answer to that question would be, don't be governed by your circumstances. But I think a better answer to that question is, a more realistic answer is to consider all of your circumstances, or better focus on your weightiest circumstances. I just finished reading a book by uh, Cal Newport called Deep Work. And in one chapter, he talks about science writer Winnie, Winnie, I'm sorry, Winifred Gallagher. And she was diagnosed with a pretty uh, nasty cancer about 11 years ago. And she writes, This disease wanted to monopolize my attention, but as much as possible, I would focus on my life instead. The, new, the, the, the cancer treatment that followed was exhausting and terrible, but uh, Winifred Gallagher couldn't help noticing that her commitment to focus on what was good in her life, like movies, walks, and a 6.30 martini, worked surprisingly well. Her life during this period should have been mired in fear and pity, but it was instead, she noted, often quite pleasant. And Cal Newport writes, we tend, to think, we, we tend to place a lot of emphasis on our circumstances. According to Gallagher, decades of research contradict this understanding. Excuse me. Our brains instead construct our worldview based on what we pay attention to. If you focus on a cancer diagnosis, you and your life become unhappy and dark. But if you focus instead on an evening martini, you and your life become more pleasant, even though the circumstances in both scenarios are the same. As Gallagher summarizes, who you are, what you think, feel, and do, what you love, is the sum of what you focus on. For Gallagher, focus on movies, walks, and a daily drink helped her through her cancer. But as believers, we have far, far greater realities to pull us through and to keep us joyful. Okay, so these circumstances of a bad bank account and high blood pressure and a pandemic and racial problems... These are, these are real circumstances, but if you're a Christian, those are not all your circumstances. That's just a narrow set of, of the realities of the factors in your life. Um, let's consider some other circumstances that should make you joyful. You are no longer condemned. Hell is no longer in your future. It was in your future. It's still a reality, but it's not part of your reality. You will not pay the price for your sins. Jesus already did it, and you are forgiven. You are heading to heaven. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have taken up residence within you. You're going to be raised from the dead and live forever. The trials that you experience now are only temporary. You are going to live with your saved loved ones and the Lord forever. The trials that you experience now are under God's authority, and he's actually using them to bring great good to you and to others. Jesus is with you now and forever. And he will never leave you or forsake you. And he is perfecting you. So these, these are some of your circumstances as well. Those are your circumstances. So when you run into trouble and are tempted to be morose, make sure you focus on your weightiest circumstances. Not just the ones that are in your face at the moment, the ones that are temporary, but the ones that are, that are going to be characteristic of you for eternity. The ones that are determining and driving your eternal future. Not the ones that affect you for just a moment in time. Will you experience sorrow in this life? Absolutely. Will you experience pain? Yes. But always rejoice. That's what this verse says. Rejoice always. And you say that's nonsense? I don't think so. The Apostle Paul is the one who wrote this. Uh, the Apostle Paul suffered tremendously. Sometime, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and read through that chapter and, and see all the things that the Apostle Paul endured after he became a Christian. And yet he says of himself, he describes himself this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, that he is, quote, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, and yet possessing everything, end quote. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. There's the key. Rejoice in the Lord. You can rejoice always because you are always in the Lord as a Christian. And that is your greatest circumstance. The Christian life is a life of joy. It's a mixed joy, granted, and there is suffering. And Jesus, Jesus said things like, I, did not, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. So there's the reality of suffering in the life of the believer. But Jesus also said things like John 16, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 
So we're, we are to rejoice, and we have reason and cause to rejoice, even in the midst of difficulty. Um, Jesus has overcome the world, and because of that, you will overcome the world as well. 1 John 2.17, the world and its desires are passing away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The one who is connected with Jesus Christ lives forever, and the world and all the friction and the problems that it causes are going to drop away out of your life. You can rejoice for that reason. So what I want you to do right now is just pause the video for a minute, take a piece of paper and a pencil, and I want you to write down three of three circumstances that are true of you that should cause you to rejoice. All right. So, uh, first step, uh, first command, rejoice always. Second one, verse 17, pray constantly. Pray constantly, or constantly pray, or continually pray, or unceasingly pray. So, am I violating this command right now by talking to you instead of talking to God? If I'm supposed to be praying continually, am, am I in violation of that command since I'm not actually talking to him at the moment? Well, no. Obviously, God has commanded us to, for instance, encourage one another, or to help one another, or to serve one another, or to teach one another, or to witness to others. And he has built in us the need to sleep. And all of these things require us to break from focused talking to God. So what does it mean to pray continually? First, let me quote one Christian teacher. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce writes, To pray without ceasing does not mean that every other activity must be dropped for the sake of prayer, but that every activity must be carried on in a sense of prayer, which is the spontaneous outcome of a sense of God's presence. So, Pray continually involves a continual awareness that we are not alone, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always with us and that their ear is always open to us. And to pray continually means also that at any time you might talk to the Lord. It means that at random points throughout the day or night, you are talking to the Lord, whether that's vocalized prayer or whether it's silent prayer, whether it's your mind and your heart praying, but your lips and your throat aren't involved. Or... Um, it might involve singing to the Lord, or it might involve crying out to help, uh, crying out to the Lord for help. Uh, you and and it means also that you can talk to the Lord about anything. He invites you to do that over and over again in His Word. I loved it, and some of you know this. I loved it when my kids were young. For instance, my oldest son, uh, when he was uh, six, seven, eight, nine years old, and. Uh, when it was time for bed, I would go in and we would pray together and I would pray and he would pray. And I loved his prayers because his prayers were simply reciting the activities of the day to the Lord. He simply told the Lord everything he did that day. It was great. Um, and, and the Lord loves to hear that. He wants us to talk about stuff with him, all the things that are going on in our lives. So when it, when it, when it comes to praying, let me just make these three suggestions. When it comes to praying, it is good for, you, for Christians, it is good for you as a Christian, first of all, to have a set time of prayer each day. A set time where you are focused on prayer. Uh, for instance, we read that Daniel prayed three times a day. He had three regular set times a day when he, that's what he did. Uh, he talked to the Lord. Um, so have a set time of prayer each day, a regular time of prayer. Uh, and then second, uh, it's good for a Christian to pray with other believers. So it's good for you to have regular prayer with other believers in, in a prayer meeting of some sort or Bible study or whatever. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. And then thirdly, uh, um, in addition to a set time of prayer each day, in addition to praying with other believers, then there's this notion of praying continually, spontaneously talking to the Lord throughout the day about your day, about what's going on in your life or about others. Or praying the Lord's Prayer and elaborating on what that means. So what can you talk about? For instance, let me give, just give you some examples. Talk to him about your car repair that's coming up. Uh, thank him for your food. Uh, tell him that you love that sunset. Ask him, <coughs> ask him to calm you down, to calm your nerves as you climb into the dentist chair. Uh, ask him to guide your conversation with your neighbor. Apologize to him for yelling at your son or your daughter or your spouse. Praise him for his patience with you. Uh, ask him to prompt your sister or your brother or your son or daughter to start reading their Bible. 
Uh, ask him for help as you place that call to insurance. Ask him to encourage your aunt or your uncle um, with their cancer and to heal them. Uh, thank him for your church family. Um, what, one of my own personal goals as a believer, just personally, is that I will pray about more things and that I will pray more about things. Actually, I typically word it in my mind differently. That I will pray more about things and that I will pray about more things. In other words, that I will devote, devote more prayer to the issues that come up in my life and also that um, I will expand the things that I talk to the Lord about. I, um, I, I think in most believers' minds, we have these two sets of things um, and there's a divide between them. There's In the one category, there's the things that we talk to the Lord about, um, whether it be uh, health, the salvation of people, um, whatever, there's certain things that we talk about. And then there's another category of things that we never talk to the Lord about. Um, we're self-reliant, um, we don't see the need to talk to the Lord about them, or whatever. And it's a subconscious divide. Uh, it probably, um, and so, <clears throat> my own personal goal is, I know I have this category of things I don't talk to the Lord about. My personal goal is that this category will shrink. That I will recognize that, hey, there's this thing that I don't talk to the Lord about, and there's this other thing. And that I will start talking to him about those things as well, whether it's asking for help or praising him or thanking him or, or what have you. Because the Lord wants to hear about all that stuff. Let me just share with you a couple of answers to prayer personally, recently. And these are small things. Uh, for instance, um, several months ago, um, I, uh, I would, I, there's a set of books that I really enjoy and I had, not, uh, I had not laid my eyes on them for five or six years, and I had been looking for them. So I thought I had lost them, but I thought, no, I didn't get rid of them. And so I asked the Lord, Lord, you know where those books are at. If they are in my possession, would you please tell me where they're at? And instantly, he put it in my mind to look in an unused piano bench in my study here at the church. And uh, there's stuff on top of it. <laughs> unused piano bench was used on top as a kind of a shelf for things. So I cleared everything off, I looked in, and what do you know, those books were there. <laughs> Answer to prayer. And then just recently, um, uh, my wife, <laughs> uh, on a regular basis, has to deal with a, a government insurance agency, and um, it, it's always a hassle. It's always a hassle, and it always involves a lot of unnecessary, redundant um, work on my wife's part, and lots of time spent on the phone. So she got a notice that she needed to, to uh, do some more fact finding or whatever for this particular agency, and we uh, so um, we prayed about it. And I prayed that uh, she would find someone who was helpful and sympathetic, and this would not result in all the kind of work that it normally does. And what do you know? The next day she talked to him. It was a short phone call. The person was very sympathetic and very helpful, and understood that they already had all the data that they usually request from us. So, you know, the Lord answers prayer. Some Christians don't believe in prayer. They don't believe that prayer will help. Now, they wouldn't say that, but it shows in their prayerlessness. Um, there, there's this idea in their mind that talking to God's not going to help, or that he's not there, or that he's not listening, or that he doesn't care. And all of those assumptions are wrong and contradicted by Scripture. Prayer works. Prayer helps. Prayer will build your faith, and it will improve your life. So what I want you to do right now is just pause, pause for a moment, and I want you to tell, uh, talk to the Lord briefly about three things that are going on in your life right now, or about three concerns that you have, or whatever. And it could be thanks, it could be praise, it could be confession, it could be some kind of a request. Just talk to him briefly about three things right now. Well, the third step is, in everything, give thanks. Or, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you were with us a few weeks ago, we talked about the question, um, what is God's will for my life? And we noted that there are some very clear answers in Scripture, such as 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and 4. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, so that each of you knows how to control his own body in sanctification and honor. What is God's will for my life? My sanctification, my sexual purity. 
verse 18 answers that question very clearly as well. What is God's will for my life? Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's pretty clear. We are, we are to be um, grateful, grateful people. Uh, first of all, finding, finding things to be thankful for should not be difficult for a Christian. It should not be difficult for a Christian. Uh, let's start with the S's. God has given, you to, given to you his Son, He's given to you salvation, he's given to you his Holy Spirit, and he's given to you the scriptures. Think for a moment what your life would be like without those four gifts from God. His Son, uh, salvation, the Spirit, and the scriptures. What would your life be like? Be Totally different, right believer? Totally different. And so we can give thanks to God in every circumstance for those gifts. And let's skip back to the R's. You have been ransomed, you have been redeemed, and you have been reconciled. Not to mention the fact that you have been adopted as God's child, you have been justified, you are being sanctified, and you will be glorified. Psalm 103, verses 2 through 5, gives us several things that we can be thankful for um, in all circumstances, in everything. Praise the Lord, O my soul, who, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins. God forgives all your sins. We can be thankful for that who heals all your diseases, we can be thankful for that. Who redeems your life from the pit. You say, I didn't know my life uh, had been in a pit. Well, it had been in a pit, and he redeemed your life from it. Who crowns you with love and compassion. Now, if you grew up in a home where your parents said they were going to crown you, that wasn't always a good thing. But the kind, of the kind of thing that God is good, the kind of crowning that God does is with love and compassion. That's a good thing. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So there, there are more things for you to be thankful for. Even when bad things happen, there is so much to be thankful for. For one thing, experiencing bad things is just a temporary phase for you if you're a Christian. It's just a temporary phase. Now, you may, be, you may have experienced bad things all your life thus far, but I'm telling you, as a believer, it's temporary. It may, it may happen for 70, 80, 90 years, but after that, all that experiencing bad things, that's going, to be a, that's going to be a forgotten memory in the past. Um, for the next 10,000 years, peace, security, joy, happiness, satisfaction, blessings, only good things. And for the 10,000 years after that, and for the 10,000 years after that, and on into eternity. Second, the Bible is clear that God is even using your bad things for good. 2 Corinthians 4.17 for our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. God is using the bad things in our life to weave together a, an eternal glory that far outweighs all these bad things, according to 2 Corinthians 4.17. And then there's Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, even the bad things, God is working for our good. He's using the bad things for our for our good. Third, <clears throat> excuse me, even in the bad things, there is much to be thankful for. And let me just give you an example. Have you ever been robbed? Have you ever been robbed? A few hundred years ago, uh, there was a preacher by the name of Matthew Henry, and he was robbed of his wallet. And back then they called it a purse. So he was robbed of his purse. And he wrote about, he wrote in his journal about being robbed by this thief. And he, and he, he wrote about the things he's thankful for. He says, let me be thankful, first, because he never robbed me before. Second, because although he took my purse, he did not take my life. Third, because although he took all I possessed, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. So, just to put it in everyday language, the four things he was thankful for. In this robbery, as a result of this robbery, the, these, the, the things that he, Matthew Henry was prompted to be thankful for was, first of all, one, that this guy had only robbed him once. And that, and that this was not a, a, a recurring thing. Um, two, he was thankful that um, he was only robbed and not murdered. Three, he was thankful that he didn't have much to be robbed of. And four, he was thankful that he was the one that was robbed and that he himself was not the robber. In order that, in other words, that the crime he experienced was something that was outside of him and not that he, and not that he himself led a life of crime. His attitude, his perspective on this, on this bad thing, this bad thing that happened to him, his attitude reminds me of the little boy who was out in the backyard 
with a baseball and a baseball bat. And he said, I am the greatest hitter in the world. And he threw the ball up in the air and he swung at the ball and he missed. He looked at the ball and he said, strike one. He grabbed the ball again, took the bat on, put, a, put the bat on his shoulder and said, I am the greatest hitter in the world. Threw the ball up in the air, swung again, and he missed. Strike two. Picked up the ball, had the bat ready, threw the ball up in the air. I am the greatest batter in the world. Swung at the ball and he missed. The ball landed on the ground. And he looked at the ball and he said, strike three. Wow, I am the greatest pitcher in the world. That's the kind of attitude that we as Christians are to have. Um, if life hands you lemons, make lemonade. And that's not just something fanciful that we can do, because the reality is that we have much to be thankful for. That is the reality. That is the hardcore truth. Those are the facts. We have much to be thankful for, even in the midst of bad things that are going on in our life. Because the, the good things in our life far outweigh the bad things. And in fact, God is using those bad things and weaving, together, weaving them together to bring us great good now and for eternity. So let me ask you, if you will, to pause the video again, and I want you to write down three things that you're grateful for. Three things that you're grateful to God for, and they can be big or little. Well, just to wrap this up, you should be rejoicing and praying and giving thanks continually, regularly, always. You should be joyful, prayerful, and thankful. Taking these three commands seriously, practicing them will build your faith and improve your life. Christians should not be sour and prayerless and ungrateful. So let me just ask you, are you joyful, prayerful, and thankful? Or are you sour, prayerless, and ungrateful? How, how would other people characterize you? How would they characterize you? Would they characterize you? Would, would your friends and family characterize you as someone who is more joyful or more overwhelmed? Would they, would they characterize you as someone who is more prayerful or more prayerless? Would they characterize you as someone who is more thankful or more of a complainer? If you, and let me say, if you tend to be sour and prayerless and ungrateful, will you own it right now? Just own it and tell the Lord, I, I am this way. I don't want to be this way. And let me tell you that nothing is stopping you from changing. Well, possibly inertia and the force of bad habits are stopping you. But let me tell you that those things are not, if you're a Christian, those things are weak things compared to the Holy Spirit who is within you. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you have the Word of God right now that is prompting you to start rejoicing and praying and giving thanks. And let me encourage you to start doing this on a regular basis, to, uh, consciously, each day, rejoicing in the Lord, um, rejoicing in the Lord for something, um, praying more, and um, giving thanks to the Lord for something. Start practicing these things. And let me encourage you, too. I, I mentioned at the outside about me memorizing these three verses. Um, I know I kind of said that in jest, but I, I'm really not jesting. These are three verses that are very easy to memorize. And, and having that Word of God in your mind and on your heart will help to prompt you, especially if this is difficult for you, will help to prompt you, uh, will remind you to start rejoicing more, uh, to start um, praying more, to start uh, giving thanks more and complaining less. Um, and I truly believe that doing these three, three things will strengthen your faith. I know they will build your faith and they will improve your life. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I, I do pray for my... Uh, friends and my brothers and sisters in Christ who are watching right now, and I ask, Lord, that you would help them um, to become better at uh, rejoicing in you always and in praying continually and in giving thanks in all circumstances. For we know that this is the, your will uh, for us in Christ Jesus. I pray for your blessing upon each one. I, I ask, Lord, that you would meet their needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, until we meet again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.